Hello, friends of the internet. I am thrilled to be here today with Vera uh, Brunner Sung, the director, writer, and editor of Bitterroot, as well as, as Cassia, the producer and assistant director, as well as Q Ru, who plays Song. The film Bitterroot centers on a middle aged man reeling from a failed marriage who is now responsible for taking care of his aging mother and her root vegetable garden. For those who will be in New York for Tribeca, you can catch the film at AMC 19th Street this Saturday, June 8th at 6.15 p.m. at Tribeca Film Center on Tuesday, June 11th at 9 a.m. And then a final screening at Village East Angelica on Saturday, June 15th at 3.15 p.m. Vera, Cassia, Q, thank you for joining me. And apologies in advance if I got any of those pronunciations wrong. Thanks for having us. Yeah, you know. we're glad to be here. I was just watching the film just before I popped on this interview. I didn't finish all of it. I got 90% done. I just have like 10 or 15 minutes left, but I wanted to watch before I came on the interview. But yeah, I've got questions for all three of you, for all three of you. So let's get into it. I wanted to talk first to Vera about the landscapes of rural Man Montana. Can you discuss how you approach capturing the essence of rural Montana and how that landscape affects its characters? Yeah, great question. It's This is my second feature in Montana, and the landscape is such an important part of the experience there, right? It's what people think of, it's the first thing people think of in Montana. With the way we approached it with a cinematographer, Kijin Kim, we thought a lot about space. So the landscape, as well as interior domestic spaces, and kind of the freedom of the broad, big spaces of the mountains, the, the rivers, the forests that the characters felt when they're out. So the mother, when she's in the garden and that sort of like vastness and and Lou, the, the lead character, the son, when he's on the river and how we could kind of create this compression and expansion of space with the camera. So we have a lot of these like very tight close-ups that then sort of expand. We move into these extreme wides here and there, that they showcase the landscape, but they also do something emotionally for the storytelling about what the characters are going through. Yeah, there's a lot of wide and close-up shots. One that sticks out to me particularly was when Lou is coming back from, well, I won't spoil it, he's coming back from something, and the camera's point of view is just looking up at the sky for the yeah. entire thing, not focusing on Lou, specifically focusing on more on the landscape, on the sky, the trees, things like that. Yeah, this sort of like implied POV. Yeah. Um, the, the approach was really to trust the audience to connect with what we're looking at, how we're moving through space and not to lead people too much, to create space for them to decide and consider and connect on their own. Yeah, of course. I would love to hear about challenges on set or, and you know, yeah, just the, the, you often hear, I talked about this yesterday, but with somebody else, I can't remember. I've, I was in two or three interviews yesterday, but there's always the quote of filmmaking is hard, right? Um, yeah, so I'd love to hear about any challenges or any stories about producing the film. Yeah, thank you. I think my role as a producer has a lot to do with also my identity as a Hmong American woman, being part of this production that is about Hmong Americans and the narrative is strongly surrounding by a son and a mother. Of course, there's that quote that filmmaking is hard, but I think what it is, is filmmaking takes up a village to make, takes a community to make it together. Yeah. And depending on how you approach that and how you built your relationship, that will determine the rise and fall of the production. And we know from my, I mean, we, in terms of like, I know in my background, family is part of our value. And when we do that, we have intentions to build relationship and trust. And the thing about filmmaking too, what people don't talk about is filmmaking is very invasive. Filmmaking is very all about capitalism. Filmmaking is all about the demands and what we can get to make sure the picture and, the, and everything goes according to, you know, a product. Well, this story is not just a product. This story is about people. And so yeah. monetizing people in their lives and their story, then that's the wrong footing to even start 
a story or filmmaking. And so as a producer, it's a lot of care. It's a lot of trust that you have to build. It's a lot of making sure that there's good intention. Then a lot of it is approaching the community. Like for example, the Hmong Missoula community and building that trust to let us film in their home, personal home versus building a set, which we also did. The thing about it is that we're trying to keep the story very authentic and very much in the vision and line of Vera, but also with respect to the land and the people there. When you have all that factor, a lot of the approach is really the care you can bring into it. As a producer, I'm very proud of the fact that we are able to make this film, but also very much practice some of the values that I know I uphold. That's one of the important things as a producer. So challenges are always there, but I think the pride of bringing in values that are instilled in me from my upbringing and being Hmong American and bringing that to the set is what makes it such a beautiful collaboration. I'll echo that thing of the movie is really about people. And I think that would be one of the reasons I recommend it. I know we get a lot of character pieces, a lot of character films, but this is one of the ones where I think without having such that community feel and personal connection, it wouldn't be the same movie. I had a question for Q, but I can wait on that. I'll go back to Vera. So you play two roles. uh, Well, actually three roles. You directed, wrote, and edited. So how did you navigate the balance between all these three roles? I, I know we've got a lot of directors and writers in the festival, but writing and editing is something I haven't seen yet in the festival. (laughs) <laughs> yes, they are three different jobs. So yeah, to 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 switch gears between those jobs is it's really tricky. And I and I understand why more people don't do it. It's really hard. <laughs> I've always edited my own work, particularly my short films. I did some additional editing on my first feature, but had worked with a primary editor on that. Um I guess it has something to do with making personal cinema. And that's Mm -hmm. my background coming from this experimental film place where most experimental filmmakers are one person film bands. (laughs) And there's a lot of like freedom and um, autonomy in that. That's very empowering. And at a certain point, I became like just interested in the collaborative filmmaking experience because you can you can just do more right you can work at a different scale and that became really exciting to me and so I still sort of carried over some of my I guess it is something about my intention and my sort of values and kind of touching all the parts of the film so yeah I guess that's the sort of ethos that this approach comes from and one of the great gifts of playing three different roles like this in, you know, development through to post-production is you learn so much about all the other pieces by doing that. So editing this film will make me a stronger screenwriter. I know very well. Um, And, you know, the same thing with directing, you know, it's going to make me a better, a better director to have edited it and written it, you know, like, so, so they all sort of like feed feed each other yeah of course i want to bounce this question to q and again apologies if the pronunciation is wrong uh but i wanted to talk about your character song the movie is kind of a two-hander between lou and song so i wanted to ask what aspects of her journey resonated with you personally and how do you portray her on screen when I first saw the script, I felt like it was a lot about, you know, most of the time when I was on set, I felt like I was just playing myself because growing up as a Hmong woman, the experience that song goes through just resonates with most Hmong women who, after the husband died, choose to remain widow for the rest mm-hmm. of their lives and take care of their children. And then the struggles that they go through as a single mom and being able to leave the country and going through war raising children on her own, the difficulties of survival. All of that brings it down to her character at the end, the aging, the bitterness, the hardship, the the amount of pressure she puts on her son because she pretty much rests her whole life on her son's shoulder to raise him. 
And so all of that pressure, I think it resonates with the character. And, and so I felt that it was my responsibility to carry that through. She even has lines in the movie where I think Lou is taking her back from the hospital where she's like, I centered my whole life around you. What more do you need? Yes. And being able to live in the United States, you know, here, children are independent, you know, they make their own decisions and, you know, lose middle aged. And yet here's the mom, you know, traditionally, when you live in a traditional mom household, you respect your elders and the decisions you consult with your parents, even though you are, you know, 30s and 40s. And so those decisions are living in a Hmong culture versus living in here in the United States, be able to put that together, um, I think is the dual dynamic between Lou and his mom is that he has, he grows up here as, as an American, Hmong American yeah. versus the mom who was born overseas. And she carries that tradition and that value with her, who wants to instill those values into her son. And I think that you know that that's what's causing the friction, but also at, again, it's it's what plays um, between them and and the the love that they have for each other. I want to go back to you, Cassia. You're also taking on the role of assistant director, so I'd love to hear from you about your collaboration with Vera on how to bring her vision to life on set. Uh, so, I mean, during our producer team and Vera, we talked about how important it is for representation for Hmong people to be on camera and behind camera, but also how important it is to have a Hmong first assistant director who can speak with, to the cast and to the community and also really beyond what a first AD is, which a lot of people don't know is a lot of logistical planning and just straight up like communication to all departments. So that is one key point, which is just kind of having a positive and good looking behavior and being a good moral compass on the set to really ease any tension. The role as a first AD as a Hmong person, I think the most beautiful example I can bring up is the hoopli, which is the ceremonial part when Song is getting um, the healing done by the shaman. At that point, it was like, okay, there's no better way to direct this than just allow the Hmong actors and the Hmong just be what they know and what they're familiar in that space. And so to communicate that and to also have Vera and I just take a step back to allow that to happen, have that collaboration happen, it's that's that's a beautiful moment. That's what you see and that's what you witness. So a lot of it is not like, oh, here's a setup. This is what you need to do. Here's a breakdown of the script. Because a lot of the time when it's improvised and there's like a dance between the DP, director, and cast, the dance is beautiful to allow that to happen in that space, but everyone is aware. And so I find it very satisfying being in a position of a first AD to really like highlight and showcase that work, especially I think when more films that are language inclusive, this is definitely a, a U.S. American film, but I know the language is like fully 100% almost um, Hmong. And so usually, like, I don't want it to be like a minority where it will be put into a category of foreign language because it's not where a lot of us are born here, raised here. And so that I hope that that speaks to this film and more like films to come um, that is like language inclusive. And so with that, then you need to make sure you have the right people also on set. Yeah. And I want to key in on that last point. That's a really good point because I know you've got that controversy with the Oscars where it's like a certain percentage needs to be in a certain language for it to be considered English language, which is, I'll just say it right now, it's just bogus. Just, you know, have a fact sheet that you send out, but that's a whole enchilada that needs to be unpacked in like a two hour conversation. <laughs> but <laughs> I want to go back to you. I want to talk about the community uh, aspect of it, specifically referring to the Hmong community. What significance does that representation of that community hold for you? And how did you approach it, depicting that culture in, in the performance of song? That's a very good question. How did I approach it? I'm very familiar. The first thing we did when, we, when I arrived in Montana is that Vera took us to the farmer's market. And that is where... 
a lot of, but you'll see that from, it's, it's small, but you can see that most of the produce there are, are produced by Hmong, the Hmong community. And so when we walked in there, it was like, oh my God, so-and-so is here, so-and-so is there. So the entire community was there. Right? It's Saturday. Yeah, it was a Saturday. It was a farmer's market day. So the entire community was pretty much there. So we were able to have more food. You know, we have more vegetables. There was also flowers there that were grown by Hmong. And so you have this entire community who have made this impact since they arrived in Montana to take over this part of a need that was established in the community. So can you imagine a farmer's market had that not been Hmong there? What would it have been like? So to me, I felt very proud of how they come together. Even during the shoot, we had Hmong food because the community came together. They fed us. They welcomed us into their home. And so it was very much like the movie, what you saw, what we you know. Of course, and then along with that goes the gossip, right? And so that was how a lot of communication passed through is, is through gossip and how to care through coming together. So that's how I approached it. So I hope that answered your question. No, it perfectly does. And I'll answer one of your questions. What it would have looked like is because I've been to a farmer's market, not in Montana, but there used to be a, well, there still is. Uh, I used to live in Kansas City and we'd have far farmer's market Saturdays there and in Kansas. It's just a lot of honey, a uh, lot of beef, and <laughs> no moral uh, mushrooms uh, that I could think of. Uh, just basic, basic food. It, it's n not a good experience uh, other than, you know, supporting local uh, businesses. Uh, but yeah, uh, that would be my answer of what it would look like. <laughs> uh, probably <laughs> just a lot of that stuff going on. I want to talk about something I noticed in the film something specific there's this hum tone that kind of pervades a lose store portion of the film for lack of a better phrase and i want to talk about that could you discuss the decision behind uh, incorporating that element of the sound design and its significance within the narrative without getting too spoilery sure yeah i mean i always knew sound was going to be really important and it would come together right in the sound design and the presence this like there is this through line right of the spirit realm mm -hmm. and this connection between the human living you know uh grounded everyday worlds and and this other space it took a while to find the right sound that could alert the audience and the characters to that other zone and that other presence. And what was really important is that it would not be creepy or scary or spooky in some way. Yeah. It was really important to not and the same thing with the score, actually, to shy away from reverb and anything else that was like typical cue for eerie, because the spirit world is like always there, right? It's not mm -hmm. a ghost story. It's not a... So it took a while that we had various temp sounds in there. And then ultimately in the sound design in the final mix, the sound designer, Tim Korn, and I were having conversations about like he laid out some options and then I could say, oh, I think it's just this like this ringing, right? And this also came from a conversation with Melissa about, you know, what what that presence could feel like and how do people talk about it when they have that feeling, that experience of like, oh, I felt this other presence. And so that, I think this cue kind of honors that experience too. I, I wanted to make sure that it would, Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I I'll definitely say it was alerting because I was like, is that my tinnitus or <laughs> is that happening in the movie? I mean, tinnitus was a reference. It was like, it's tinnitus. It's, uh, well, mission accomplished yeah. then. Dude, <laughs> hitting, hitting that reference point because I'm like, Sorry, ah, is, and is yes. that me or, or is that the movie? But yeah, mission accomplished. It's also about the play with the, the diegetic sound too, which was because the ringing needed to be, that spirit tone needed to be diegetic also, right? It shouldn't feel like score. 
So it had to come from inside of the film, but it also kind of has this relationship with the ambience that is kind of dynamic. So yeah, thank you for noticing yeah. that and asking about it. <laughs> You're welcome. And I, for one, love a diegetic score. It feels, I, that's an easy way to get me into a movie is making sure the sounds are pre also present in the environment. Because, I mean, if they're already happening in the environment, it feels more natural. Then I want to go to Cassia real quick. I want to talk about the moment-to-moment -moment character moments. Anyways, can you discuss the importance of fostering a supportive environment on set? I think an aspect that I can bring up and focus on is in terms of, so in terms of, in terms of like a, as a producer, bringing in the right people and also bring, giving opportunities to be represented both in, in front of the camera and behind the camera, that we were able to bring like Hmong filmmakers from Minnesota into Missoula who are pursuing filmmaking as a career and as crew. So having them on set and knowing that people are familiar with each other and people get to learn who they are or or the cast are familiar with, you know, there's more Hmong people on set than there are more white people who don't speak the language or who don't know some cultural nuances of certain things that it just kind of shifts just a tad about how the production is. And then on set in terms of the performance and with the cast, it's really, it's amazing to see the dynamic between Wa, who plays Lou, and Q, who plays Song, the mom, because they're bantering outside, like when the camera's not rolling, it's something that brings so much joy to the set because there's, you know, like, and, 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 and I think this is, and it's not trying to exclude non Hmong speakers, but what sure. it is, is very specific in terms of their building their relationship on set while they're waiting for the camera to roll. And so I remember there's some inside jokes that Q, as much as she is our mother, she's very comedic and very and she's like forever 16 in her heart so she's always just joking around on set and that's just some brightness that really helps when there's difficult times it's just kind of like hey it's been an exhausting day you know how some films are there 12 hour shoots and we're just chugging through but when people who are like hey it's a choice to be kind and it's a choice to be happy and it's a choice for how we can control our own reaction and to have those understanding on people on set like Q and Wa and, and everyone else who's been very, like, who helped me the film, that I, it, it's been wonderful. And so, but, you know, like, and then the most beautiful thing as a first AD, what I witnessed, and again, this speaks to the professionalism, even though our casting is non-traditional in terms of Hollywood standard and large independent film, is that... They are the characters, but they are who they are as well. And so when Q, before the camera rolls, she can crack a joke and then camera's rolling and she's just like, all right, son, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I think like having people like that and, and and another one I do want to point out is April Charlo, who plays, though the name's never mentioned, Eddie, the Blackfeet Slayish woman on our, on our, in Bitterroot. April is also an amazing wonderful individual who again crack jokes make everyone smile and the camera's on her performance is amazing so again I, I it, it is about finding sometimes it is chance that you find the right type of people and all I can say is that we've been lucky yeah for sure uh, definitely and then I have one final question the movie is delving into themes of family duty resilience things like that what inspired the exploration of those themes and what message do audiences take away from the film at Tribeca 2024 or in the future? Well, those are our themes and I think they're, I'm glad you picked up on those things. I want to make films that create space for people to reflect and connect and that stay with people. We live in a time where so many films are available just at the click of a button to be able to experience this film in a theater with other people, for it to be something that people can sit with for a while and reflect on. I, I, that's my that's my hope for it. 
that it touches people in that way. It's a movie about survival, right? And, yeah. and how we survive. And I think that's important right now. I think it's always been important. And it's a theme that Hmong Americans, Hmong communities know a lot about. For me, you know, I was saying like, oh, this film is personal. It's I'm not Hmong. How is it? And so how is it personal, right? Montana is a place when I lived there where I first experienced the loss of friends. And so I think that's also something in the the landscape there for me personally, grief and, you know, continuing on. And then, you know, this other theme of, of connection is something that is always in my work. Um, I'm, I'm an only child. My parents are both immigrants from opposite sides of the world. Um, I grew up very far from extended family. And this question of how we are, how we exist, independent of and as a part of a group, and the tension between belonging to a group and belonging to yourself, that's always something that I'm coming back to in my projects. So, yeah, yeah, and we think about a question I don't have time for, but maybe I'll message the publicist because I'm like, that makes me think of May, the character, but that's getting into spoilers. So, <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm sorry. I, I've got to sit uh, to the next, but yeah, no problem. Really, so, really appreciate um, this conversation. So, yeah. So yeah. thank you all for joining me. You can catch Bitterroot at AMC 19th Street this Saturday, June 6th, 15 at Tribeca Film Center, Tuesday, June 11th at 9 a.m. And a final screening at Village East Angelica on Saturday, June 15th at 3.15 p.m. Everyone have a good day. You too. Thank, thank you. Bye, Austin. Bye. Bye. Bye.